my friend Jim was hosting a wine dinner. He was already in a tasting group and he wanted to introduce me to the group as a new member. Everybody's supposed to bring a special bottle of wine. This fellow brings a 1985 Salon Champagne, one of the premier champagnes available. It's beautiful. And the 85 was a spectacular vintage. But I'm a knucklehead <laughs> and I don't know anything about champagne. And I whispered to Jim, who's the guy who brought the old champagne? I thought this was supposed to be a special dinner. I'm not drinking that. Jim's like, well, you may want to try it. And it was another one of those aha moments, Natalie, where I remember very clearly tasting that wine and thinking, wow, how does it taste like that? What have I been missing all my life? Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 132. What's it like tasting wines with the legendary wine critic, Robert Parker? How does food take wine to the next level? And what's it like to have dinner with celebrities in the wine world? You'll get those stories and more wine tips in today's chat with Scott Greenberg, host of both the Vine Guy podcast and the Wine of the Week show on WTOP Radio in Washington, D.C. If you're listening to this podcast on the day it's published, you have one more day to register for the online tasting with me tomorrow, June 10th, that's Thursday, of some wonderful rosé wines. Or you can just crack open your favorite rosé. I'll give you tips on pairing rosé with food and serving it in the right glass for maximizing your pleasure all summer long. I think you'll be surprised just how far rosé has come, both in its quality and complexity, its taste, and its dryness. There is no cost, but space is limited, so register today at nataliemcleancom forward slash rose. I'll also include this link in the show notes along with a full transcript of our conversation today, how you can join me in another online food and wine pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcleancom forward slash 132. Now on a personal note before we dive into the show. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that I'm now binge listening to memoirs as I write my own, and several of you emailed me to share your favorite memoirs and autobiographies, including Laureen, who recommended Boy, Notes from Childhood by the British writer Roald Dahl, who also wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, James and the Giant Peach, and one of my favorite short stories of all time about the ridiculousness of blind-tasting wine. Lorene found the book riveting, and I can't wait to listen to it. I listen to books on Audible rather than, um, you know, the old-fashioned print way. I'm also going to watch the movie The Witches, as that's based on another of his books. And that's another fascination of mine, witches. So when I googled the book, I discovered that Dahl's family buried him with his snooker cues, HB pencils, chocolates, top-notch good burgundy, yay, he was a Pinot Noir man, and a power saw. (laughs) A power saw, that is hilarious. I guess it was to cut his way out of the coffin if he revived. What's really touching is that children still leave toys and flowers on his grave. Several people, including my mother, mentioned Michelle Obama's Becoming, and I've got that book queued up next. Carly enjoyed Decision Points by George W. Bush much more than she expected. Rosemary just finished 
The Viceroy's Daughter by Anne de Courcy about the Courson sisters. And here are a few memoirs that I've enjoyed recently. Educated by Tara Westover, Wild by Cheryl Strayed, and The Glass Castle by Jeanette Winters. I'll link to all of these books in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 132. All right, on with the show. Scott Greenberg is also known as the Vine Guy, and we're going to find out why in a moment. He's the host of the Wine of the Week program on WTOP in Washington, D.C., as well as the Vine Guy podcast. Scott started his career in wine journalism with the Washington Journal newspaper and continues to contribute to Tastings Panel magazine. He's also hosted numerous wine tastings, judged lots of wine competitions, and he's even taught a course on North American wineries for the Smithsonian Associates in Washington, which is really cool. Scott is a Tucolon vineyard expert or specialist, I should say, and an Italian wine scholar. He recently moved from Maryland to Park City, Utah, where he lives with his wife, Cindy, and a rescue dog named Frankie. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening, Scott. Welcome. Thank you, Natalie. It's so wonderful to be here. And hopefully Frankie won't uh, butt in. So we'll see what happens. You did give me the snowplow warning. So if we hear him, he's not in trouble, but he's very excited about the snowplow. (laughs) All right. So let's start, Scott, with kind of how did you get into wine? What was the moment when you realized, wow, I want to make wine what I do full time? You know, so many of my friends have that aha moment when they're like, oh, my God, this is wine. And I had the same thing. It was back in 1994. My day job is I'm an insurance advisor. I run an insurance advisory firm in Washington, D.C. And there was this one tax attorney who was very famous, and I really wanted to get to know him, but it was impossible to get on my schedule. He was just fully booked, always booked, couldn't get any time with him. And then somebody told me that he was into wine. Now, I had no idea what into wine meant. I didn't know (laughs) if he was bathing in wine. I didn't know whatever. (laughs) But I called his secretary and I said, hey, I know I've been trying to get on this guy's calendar, but it has nothing to do with insurance. I just am really super interested in wine. Do you think he would talk to me about wine? Well, within a week, I had a date with him and we met for lunch. And of course, I had no interest in wine. I just wanted to meet him. And it turned out that as he spoke about wine, it became a living, breathing thing for me. And I really was curious. And he said, listen, I can tell you all about wine, but you really have to taste it. I'm hosting a dinner party this weekend for my new partner. Would you and your wife like to come over? Come on. I mean, Natalie, this was holy grail stuff for me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm being invited to his home for dinner. And again, no interest in wine, but I was going to form a relationship. We get to his house. My wife, who is not the most social creature in the world, says, okay, but you owe me. (laughs) Get there. (laughs) And it turns out that this dinner party is three couples. It's Jim and his wife, his new partner and his wife, and Cindy, my wife, and myself. And he goes downstairs and he pulls up this bottle and sort of you know, blows off the dust and whatever and opens it up. And he goes around and he pours everybody a glass. And as he comes to me, I said to Jim, the attorney's name, I said, Jim, I don't need a glass. I'll just share with my wife. And she looked over at me and went, No, not sharing. (laughs) You're going to want your own glass. And (laughs) he poured a glass and I tasted it. And Natalie, it's not hyperbole when I tell you that this wine changed my life. Oh, wow. It literally changed my life for several reasons. One of which is it has cost me thousands of dollars in wine purchasing since then. But (laughs) Jim has since become one of my dearest, closest friends. It has started me on a path to wine that has led me to you today, which I'm thrilled about. And the wine, for those of everybody who's wondering what it was, Mm, was a 1981 Chateau de Bocastel from Chateau Neuf de Pop. From the Rhone Valley. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I can taste it to this day. What did it taste like to you? What memories do you have of it? Well, I, I remember turning to Jim and saying, I didn't know wine could taste like this. And he said, with a twinkle in his eye, because he's mischievous, he said, oh, but it can. It just costs, it just costs a little bit <laughs> a more. A lot of money. Yeah. 
Yes. It tasted like saddle leather. I remember ah. very distinctly getting this saddle leather and kind of this wonderful earthy tone to it. And I'd never experienced anything like that in a wine before. Well, first of all, I don't think I'd ever had wine out of a bottle before. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a step up. <laughs> yeah. So it was ethereal. And as I said, it really started me on a path that I'm very grateful for to this day. Did you take courses or what did you do next after you sort of had that aha moment? Well, I started buying books and I started reading books and I did take a very interesting course, a one-on-one type of a course that was incredibly helpful that taught me how to identify what I thought I was tasting in my head or what I was smelling. And it was very valuable in terms of being able to sort of delineate those descriptors. That's great. Wow. But the wine books were really the best. Is there a favorite wine book from those early days? Well, the first one's always your favorite, right? Sure, I think, sure. Uh, Windows on the World by Kevin Zarelli is still to this day something I go back and visit often. That's a great book. Really great resource. So sort of moving forward now, what would you say has been one of the highlights of your wine career so far? Oh, today. Absolutely. Oh, Meeting oh, today. you. Oh, you are so sweet. <laughs> you caught me off guard. <laughs> this, this is it. I, I don't know how it gets any better. Uh, it's kind of the pinnacle. <laughs> That's a plant. No, thank you, Scott. That's very nice. <laughs> uh, but okay. in a, a close second, <laughs> given that we just lost Stephen Spurrier recently, mm. I did have the pleasure of having dinner with Stephen about 18 months ago before the world shut down in San Francisco. So that was really quite memorable. And He was a real leading light in the wine world. And, and for was, those who don't know him, tell us a little bit about him. Oh, well, I, he's really probably the most famous for what we know as the movie Bottle Shock, where he hosted a tasting of French wines and California wines that rocked the world. I believe it was called, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Tasting of Paris. Yes, The Judgment of Paris, but yes. Tasting. Judgment of Paris. Absolutely. 1976. That's right. Blind Tasting. Lining them up. Blind tasting, right. Where I believe Chateau Montalena's Chardonnay beat out all the white burgundies. French, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it just, it rocked the world. And it literally started a wine revolution. And he loves talking about it. And it was really great. Matter of fact, I interviewed him in the back of a limo that we shared to the airport for oh, my podcast. Great. And I was so excited about it. And the file got corrupted. Oh, no. And oh, I was no. never able to recover it. But oh. At least you have the memory, yeah. yeah. And so that was a close second, but Natalie, this is this is the highlight. <laughs> oh, you are so sweet. Okay, so let's talk about the fundraiser that you've been involved in. How did that start? Oh wow, that so my wine world started in, as I said, in 1994, and in 1996, 97, 98, in that range, I started buying wine. And I started buying futures. I started really exploring a lot of different things. Like, you know, I kind of sort of cut my teeth on those big Australian Shiraz in the day and then kind of migrated over to California and never lost my love for Rhone wines. That was always sort of the top. But I stuck my toe in the water with Bordeaux futures at some point. And I was buying from a local wine shop in Washington, D.C., When the owner's son, who I had become very close with, matter of fact, we were getting ready to go to the Union de Grand Cru. Which is a big tasting of futures, right? Yeah, big tasting of futures. And futures being wine that's in the barrel but hasn't been bottled yet. So you really are tasting wine before it's even complete, so to speak. It is kind of buying the future. (laughs) Absolutely. And, you know, thank you for pointing that out because I forget that – I will geek out sometimes. That's okay. We all love to geek out. <laughs> forget who I'm, you know, who I'm talking to. But yes, yeah, so we were getting ready to go to the Union of Grand Cru to taste some of the futures in barrel. And Bruce suddenly passed away of a heart attack at the age of 40. Oh, wow. Three young children, a lovely wife, and I was devastated. And so I was on the board of the American Heart Association at the time and decided, let's do something in his honor just to raise a little bit of money. Myself and and a few other people got together and we decided what we would do is a Bordeaux tasting in my living room. Our goal was to raise $15,000 to be able to buy a defibrillator for the airport, which at the time airports didn't have defibrillators. 
at the gate. And I think if there was a defibrillator, Bruce, while waiting for his plane, may be alive today. Mm. So that was the start of it. And we said, well, let's, you know, let's do this fundraiser. And my phone rings one day and I pick it up and I'm like, hello. And it's like, hey, Scott, this is Bob. I heard you're doing this fundraiser for Bruce. I'd really like to get involved. What are you thinking about doing? I said, oh, we're going to get a few bottles of Bordeaux. We're going to open them up because Bruce loved Bordeaux. We'll have a few people over. We'll charge admission and we'll see if we can raise a few bucks. And he said, well, I think I could really help you. Maybe I can get some of the Bordelais to actually come over with their wines and have a tasting and put on a tasting for you. And I said, well, Bob, that's great. That's amazing. But, you know, my living room is not that big. (laughs) We were thinking about 35 people. And he said, um, well, I think we might need a bigger venue. And I said, well, Bob, how are you going to get these people over here? We can't afford to fly them over. I mean, he goes, no, no, no. They'll come over on their own. They'll bring their wines. Everything will be gratis. I said, how are you planning on doing this? Why? Who are you? Right. He said, Bob well, I must have be this... connected. Bob's connected, right? I'm like, who yeah. the hell is Bob? Like, at this point, I'm like, you know, starting to get either a little paranoid or a little annoyed. I couldn't remember which. I'm like, dude, who are you? And he said, well, I have this newsletter called The Wine Advocate. <laughs> Uh-huh. Bob. Robert Parker? Robert Parker. Wow. The renowned US critic. Holy smokes. Please. Yes. You know, yeah, so I'm like, and okay, Natalie, this is how flipped out I was. This I am so embarrassed to tell you this story, but <laughs> this is how flipped out I was when he called. I said, Robert Parker? And he said, Yeah. And I said, This how did you get this number? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's an honest response. <laughs> <laughs> and, Fantastic. And the rest, as they say, is history. The event started in uh, 1999. Obviously, it did not start in my living room. We actually had to find a ballroom at the last minute. We raised $117,000 that year, which was amazing. Wow. For our first and shot, yeah. Heart's Delight, in its 20th year, we raised over $20 million for the American Heart Association. Oh, and Bravo. Wow. Bob and I developed a wonderful relationship over that time. He was very gracious by hosting the first 10 years. He stepped in and did the panels. It was great. Oh, Scott, that's a great story. Oh, my goodness. Very proud of it. Very that proud of it. That is fantastic. Well done. Is there any relation to that event and how you got the name Vine Guy, the Vine Guy? <laughs> yeah, more embarrassing stories. <laughs> <laughs> great. I love these. <laughs> So as I said, Bob and I started to develop, sorry, Robert Parker, (laughs) I started to develop a relationship (laughs) and um, he took me to a few wine tastings with him. And I'll never forget one of the tastings we went to was a California barrel sample where a lot of the California winemakers had sent barrel samples out to Bob and he invited me to come along and taste with him, which was a great experience to begin with. I mean, he would just run through... 20 wines at a time. As I recall, there were maybe about 100 wines. So there were five flights, uh, 20 wines each. So he was tasting them. He was going that fast. He was just tasting them. I was tasting it, taking it out, tasting it, taking it out, tasting it, taking it out. And he was getting annoyed. (laughs) He was like, really? (laughs) Because he was just, (laughs) right, exactly. He was just tasting them through. And then he would go back and then selectively taste others. And then he would write his notes. It was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And did he have any sort of technique that you noticed? Like, was he doing one nose, then the other nose or anything like that? Both noses. Both noses. <laughs> Both, okay. Both he nostrils, was in there. I should say. <laughs> Both nostrils, right. Yeah, he was he was in there deep. Okay. And it was amazing how, I think just how fast he was, but how incredibly accurate he was. Now, of course, he'd had years of experience and I was still a newbie. But at one point, he looks over at my notes. And like a kid in high school or so, I went to cover <laughs> I went to cover my uh, notes. Uh, don't look at my homework. <laughs> it might be wrong. <laughs> and, and, and he looked at me and he said, really? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <was> like, really? <laughs> it's kind of like, I'm Robert Parker. You're like, <laughs> I'm like, you know what? So that day at lunch, I actually did share my notes with him and he read them. And he said, you know, Scott, you should actually start writing. These notes are great. There's something here. I would really encourage you. He said, you should get a website and just start posting stuff. Hmm. Now, back wow. then, by the way, Natalie, there was no blog. This is still 
pretty early on in early 2000s where you actually had to write away for a website name to one location that issued all the website names. Right. <laughs> and I said, well, Bob, that's great, but what would I call the website? And he said, The Vine Guy. Oh, he named you. <laughs> that was it. That's how I got the moniker. Fantastic. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That's how it happened. And so do you still taste? Do you still see him at all? Or I know he's retired, so. Yeah, no, I, I haven't seen Bob in about five years. Because you've moved too, so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Wow. Yeah. What great experiences from Stephen Spurrier to Robert Parker. Holy smokes. And to Natalie McLean. Oh, well. <laughs> Just thank you. Um, let's go to a special dinner you had. Now, this may be backtracking. I'm not sure where they were pouring a particular champagne. Tell me about that. No, no, that actually did happen afterwards. As again, my friend Jim was hosting a wine dinner and had invited several of his friends. He was already in a tasting group and he wanted to introduce me to the group as a new member, if you will. And I was really thrilled. I mean, this was kind of like, oh my gosh, I, you know, this would be so much fun. And everybody's supposed to bring a special bottle of wine. I actually, at that time, still didn't have a very deep collection. So I had to purchase one from Jim to bring to this dinner. And this fellow brings a 1985 Salon Champagne. Now, for those of you who don't know, Salon is, I think, probably one of the premier champagnes oh, available. It's beautiful. And the 85 was a spectacular vintage. But... <laughs> I'm a knucklehead, and I don't know anything about champagne other than it's got bubbles. And I take a look at the bottle, and I whisper to Jim, who's the guy who brought the old champagne? I thought this was supposed to be a special dinner. I'm, I'm not drinking that. The old stuff. You don't want the that. old stuff, right? And Jim's like, well, you may want to try it before you. And again, it was another one of those aha moments, Natalie, where – I remember very clearly tasting that wine and thinking, wow, how does it taste like that? What, what have I been missing all my life? What did it taste like to you? Oh, my gosh. It tasted like fresh baked bread. Oh, it's still and, fresh. Yeah. Oh, it was. It was crisp. But it also kind of had this slightly matterized edge, that sherry-esque edge, yes. which I adore. I adore. Mm. But a little bit of like maybe dried apricot, a little bit of maybe super, super ripe nectarine, but it was the balance, the acidity and the bubbles, just the way that this wine swooned in the mouth. It was just delicious. And again, love being wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Since then, I've become kind of a, I don't know if this is a family show, but kind of a champagne whore. <laughs> <Just really. laughs> You'll try anything? <laughs> oh, yeah, pretty much. And, and fortunately, so is my wife. <laughs> That's great. But they say that aged champagne, well, first of all, a lot of people think all bubbly should be served fresh. And certainly there's lots of delight in that. But they also say aged champagne is an acquired taste. I don't know if the British started it or whatever, but it's quite a different experience. It can be, as you say, a bit matterized, a bit nutty, but... It was, yeah. Yeah, but I think it's worth exploring. It's a rare treat, too, to even be able to try vintage, like old champagne, old mature champagne. It reminds me of the uh, Steve Martin skit where he says, don't bring me that old stuff. I want a fresh wine. <laughs> That's right. I remember that. <laughs> and that was very similar. And again, the gentleman who brought that champagne and I have become the dearest of friends. And as a matter of fact, of the many special bottles, I have had the privilege of tasting. Most of them have been with him. Nice. Wow. Lots of friendships formed over good bottles. That was great. Absolutely. You have another time where you met someone while you were skiing in Deer Valley. Where is Deer Valley, first of all? Deer Valley is in Park City, Utah. It's one of the mountains. Deer Valley is kind of a neighborhood, if you will, inside Park City. And it's absolutely a wonderful, wonderful place to ski. It's just great. And I... Uh, was taking a break one day from skiing just to grab a bite to eat. And I'm standing in line to get some food. And I started talking to the guy behind me. And I was like, oh, you know, where are you from? I'm from Chicago. Where are you from? I'm from the D.C. area. Oh, what do you do? And he said, oh, I'm, a, I'm into wine. Now, by this time, I knew what into wine <laughs> meant. 
Perk up with the ears. Yes. <laughs> I, I no longer knew that, that he was bathing in wine. So I said, oh, what end of the business are you in? And he said, well, we do both importing and distribution. I said, oh, that's pretty cool. Who do you work for? He said, well, I'm John Terlato. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> and, and explain oh. for those who may not know that name, who he uh, is. <laughs> John Tolado of the Tolado Wine Group. I think they're definitely top 10, maybe top five importers, distributors in the United States. And, you know, such notable wines, for example, as Gaia uh, from oh, Italy. Italy. Uh, very top tier wine, as, as you probably know, and even their own brand. So John is, a I believe, a third generation in the business and now runs it with his brother. And it was just funny because the week before the Trollado Wine Group had sent out a PR package to 10 people in the country, which included several bottles of their wine and a pizza oven that you put on the grill and make pizza. And I said, wait, you're John Trollado? I just got one of your pizza ovens. And I said, <laughs> wait, you got a pizza oven? I said, yeah. And he goes, you got a pizza oven. <laughs> I felt like I was in The Godfather or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, you go one of them. And I was like, again, he goes, who are you again? And that was it. We were off and running and became good friends. John became a wonderful sponsor of Heart's Delight, the charity we talked about, donating wines and donating really some special treats and visits. And again, you know, you just meet the most wonderful people well, you through Well, you tend to stumble into them when, you, when you're do. not looking. I mean, but fortunately, you strike up these conversations wherever you are. I'm a friendly guy. <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> and did you interview John on your podcast? Is that right? He was actually my very first guest. Oh, wow. I told John that I was starting this podcast. He said, let me know if I could help. I said, help? How about if uh, you're my first guest? And to this day, it's one of the top three downloaded interviews on the podcast, which is now going into its second year. So Terrific. I'll have to go back and take a listen to that one. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Cool. Well, you have a great radio podcast voice. So, Why, thank you, Natalie. You're welcome. <laughs> no, I'm not even <laughs> going to try. But one time you were in a restaurant and somebody recognized your voice, which is pretty uncanny. It's one thing to be spotted, yeah. but to have your voice recognized. What happened there? Well, due to the radio show on WTOP, which not to be immodest, it's the largest terrestrial radio station in the Washington, D.C. area, so it gets a, a lot of airplay. The fellow at the table next to us at the restaurant said, I'm sorry to interrupt, but are you that guy on the radio I hear every Friday? And this annoys my wife to no end because my ego is big enough and she does not want it going any bigger. <laughs> uh, and well, yes, I am. I happen to be that. <laughs> Very same fellow who was on the radio every Friday. And he said, listen, I've been wanting to meet you. We're getting together. We're having a wine dinner. And we have a very special guest. And I'd love it if you would be my guest. I'd love to introduce you to some of my friends who are, again, into wine. I love that phrase. And I said, that's great. Do I need to bring anything? I goes, oh, no, no, no. We're having a winemaker. And he's going to bring all the wines. And I'll cover your charges. Don't worry. I just want you to be my guest. Well, turns out that the special guest was Christian Moex from France who is responsible for both Petrus, a very well-known Bordeaux wine. Top tier. Mm -hmm. Top tier. I certainly can't afford it. <laughs> and, Neither can I. Uh, and Dominus in Napa. In Napa. Again, top tier. Wow. Christian uh, was there with his wife, and I sat right next to them and had a remarkably wonderful experience. Charming, charming, charming people and delicious wines. And I came home that evening, worse the wear, if you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It was a slow day the next day. You're not going to spit said, when you're tasting those wines. Please. I, I, <laughs> That'd Natalie, be rude. I didn't spit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't spit a single glass. And I said to my wife, and that, my dear, is what my radio voice gets me. <laughs> <laughs> Did she give you a roll of the eyes? <laughs> Um, actually, she just suggested I sleep in the next room. Oh, I see. Okay. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Cindy. No. <laughs> uh, poor, exactly. My long-suffering wife. So how many different wines were you tasting? Was it kind of like in flights or? Um, it was by course. I want to say that we had, uh, best recollection was four courses. Mm. And we just had amazing pairings. So 
probably over the course of the evening, there were eight or 10 wines. Was there a particular pairing that stood out for you that you remember? Yeah, I think definitely the lamb loin with the Petrus. And I apologize, I cannot recall the vintage of the Petrus, but I'm super into pairings. I'm obsessed with pairings. Are you? Natalie, great. I'm obsessed with I pairings. I have found my people. This is great. You have I'm, found your people. I'm totally into pairings. So what is it about wine pairing that you love most? That's easy. I think wine enhances the food and food enhances the wine. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love all God's children. I really do. I drink and enjoy a lot of different styles of wine. But what I really look for the most in a wine is what can I pair it with? Is it food friendly? And yeah, occasionally I'll drink wine just on its own for the sake of drinking wine. But I really, really enjoy wine with food. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Scott Greenberg. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I think a lot of us remember that pivotal wine that changed our lives and drinking habits. I really enjoyed listening to Scott's story about his aha wine at a dinner party. Two, I also liked his story about tasting with the legendary Robert Parker and getting a sneak peek at the critic's unique tasting process. And three, mature champagne is worth trying if you haven't done so yet. You never know, you just might love it. In the show notes, you'll find a link to that free rosé tasting I'm hosting tomorrow, June 10th. There's no cost, but space is limited. So go to nataliemclean.com forward slash rosé, or rose, I should say, no accent. I'll also put that link in the show notes, where you'll find a full transcript of our conversation today, how you can join me in another free online food and wine pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m., including this evening. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 132. You won't want to miss next week when we continue our chat with Scott Greenberg. In the meantime, if you missed episode 28, go back and take a listen. I talk about Father's Day wines and are there such things as manly wines versus womanly wines outside a marketing manager's dream world? I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. One California winery has sponsored a NASCAR event on Father's Day for several years now. Others have taken a more direct approach in naming their wines for men. The Slammer is a robust Syrah from Big House Wines whose winery is close to a California state prison, a.k.a. the Big House. The dude on the label is absolute gangsta. Gnarlyhead, another California winery, aims its marketing at men who love beer from a keg. Carnivore, a Gallo brand, uses the hashtag DevourLife, aiming at millennial males. Then there's the popular gag gift wine named Fat Bass... You can fill in the last part... <laughs> I always thought that they missed a golden marketing opportunity not featuring a rather rotund man on the label with jeans plunging to plumber half-mast, or should I say half-asked. <laughs> if you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the tips that Scott shared. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a wine that pairs beautifully with a moving memoir. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.